This is sodium fluorescein ophthalmic staining in dyes. Sodium fluorescein, oftentimes abbreviated to sodium NAFL, is a low molecular weight protein dye that dissolves easily in water and penetrates into small areas. It's probably the most common dye used in the eye. It absorbs light of wavelengths of 490 nanometers around cobalt blue and emits light of wavelengths of 530 nanometers around yellowish green. We can see an image here of fluorescein being installed into a, a liquid solution and being excited by a blue light. We can see that after it's been installed and hit with the cobalt blue light, it starts to glow that light green dye. Now, sodium fluorescein has a lot of uses in the eye. One of those is in the posterior segment for, for, for fluorescein angiography. And this helps look for leaks and breaks and damage in the retina. There'll be a lot more on this in, when you're in your retinal imaging courses. For anterior segment, though, we use it quite often for a, lot, a wide variety of evaluations. Typically, it needs to be installed in either one of two forms, dry strip, which needs to have saline added before installation, or in a liquid form, which is combined with an, the anesthetic binoxinate. There are some, so, some contraindications for fluorescein installation in a person. The biggest one is allergies to fluorescein. We also times, uh, try to avoid it whenever possible with pregnancy, even though there's no evidence of topical installation of fluorescein having any problems with the fetus or, or the pregnant mother. We typically try and avoid it when they're pregnant whenever we can. And there's also serious consequences and side effects oftentimes when it's injected. There can be nausea or vomiting, there can be hives, or anaphylactic reactions resulting in hypotension and cardiac arrest. Here we can see the sodium fluorescein as it's installed into a healthy eye. This is being excited with a cobalt blue light off of our, our slit lamp or our biomicroscope. We can see then this uniform appearance of the dye, and that's ultimately the tear film we're looking at of this cornea and this conjunctiva. And the reason why we see that uniform appearance is that when we have a normal, healthy, intact corneal epithelium, stroma, and endothelium, it's a smooth, even layer that floats across that epithelial surface, and it looks regular and smooth. Now, what happens when we start to have damage to that epithelium? In this example here, we've lost a few cell, a cell or two on the anterior most part of the epithelium. What that results in is little spots that we call super, superficial punctate keratitis, or SPK. And these are little glow, green, bright green spots that we see across the cornea. This can be due to a wide variety of causes, including viral infections, bacterial infections, dry eye, allergies, as well as prolonged use of contact lenses, exposure to excessive light, such as welding arcs, as well as blepharitis. You might ask yourself, why do some of these things, the spots look greener than the others? It's a combination of two effects. One, dead cells are being actively stained sometimes by the dye. And secondly, the physical distance is longer, resulting in more dye in the tear film. An example on the right where we can see the actual diagram of the fluorescein in the tear film, when we start to lose cells, it becomes thicker as far as the fluorescein layer, layer goes. When it becomes thicker, it appears more and more green. Here's another more exaggerated system where we can see the thickness matters in these localizations. The, the tear film appears more, more is thicker and it appears more green when it's smooth and regular versus the upper image where it's thinner and so it looks darker. Now, as we lose more and more cells and have more and more damaged areas of the cornea, say like an abrasion or anything like that, we start to get more confluent staining. That means large areas of damage. And due to that, the actual the areas that we see fluorescing become larger and larger. Notice, though, that the corneal basement membrane or the or Bowman's layer is still intact in this situation. As we go, we still lose more and more cells, but as long as we maintain that Bowman's layer and the basement membrane still intact, we just see these regular punctate or, or confluent image, images of fluorescein on the cornea. If we review our Bowman's layer's anatomy, it's between the anterior mostroma and the epithelial basement membrane. It has a thickness of about 8 to 14 microns, and it randomly is randomly dispersed collagen fibrils. This acts as a physical barrier to protect, protect the subepithelial nerve plexes and thereby hasten epithelial innervation and sensory recovery. But a critical component to this is it cannot recover, it regenerate. That means we end up having a scar if we have a break through the Bowman's layer. Now, what happens when we, with fluorescein dye when we do have a break in Bowman's layer of the basement membrane? As we can see here, we have a break in that basement membrane. And what happens because the stroma is highly hydrophilic and once water, remember it's, it's slightly dehydrated at all times due to the corneal endothelium constantly pumping out water, 
it readily starts to absorb the tear film's water into the, the stroma. This brings with it the fluorescein that's dissolved in it. When this happens, because there's no longer any barrier containing where that fluorescein can go, it starts to disperse in a cloud throughout that stroma in all directions possible. And this is what we can see in the diagram on the right. If we look at it in a real human cornea, though, what we start to see is a haze or a cloud forming around the outside the area where the, the primary lesion is at. Because of this, we can tell there's a break now in the Bowman's or basement membrane that allows that fluorescein to distribute throughout the stroma, which is very hydrophilic again. Again, Bowman's layer cannot regenerate, so eventually this will leave a scar, depending on the size and break of the, of the Bowman's layer and the damage to the underlying stroma. Now, in these examples, a break in Bowman's layer and the basement membrane can be due to a, a number of different causes, including viral infections, bacterial infections, fungal infections, parasitics, as well as trauma being the most common. Trauma, though, leads directly into foreign bodies and detecting other uses of fluorescein for foreign bodies. Here we have two examples of two foreign bodies. One is a relatively superficial lesion on the left, and here on the right we have a larger, more serious puncture of the cornea. The one on the right probably has penetrated all the way through the cornea into the anterior chamber. We really can't see it though because there's so much edema right at the moment and the, the stroma itself and all the fibrils are now out of alignment, we see a haze in that cornea, which may result in a scar. The reality is, is the question we always wanna ask is, did the foreign body penetrate into the eye? In this mock example here, we see a nail that's went all the way through the, the cornea versus halfway through it or two thirds of the way through it. In this situation, you'd be pretty obvious to see that that nail went through or what didn't go through. Typically though, we can't see that the foreign, lang the foreign body penetrated. This is due to lots of different factors. Uh, the biggest ones are edema and scarring is oftentimes so dense that we can't see if we have a full penetration or a partial penetration of the cornea. Secondly, the foreign body oftentimes is removed before presenting in that office. The patient with that nail on their eye oftentimes is not going to let that, eye, that nail sit there. They're going to pull it out because of pain and panic before it gets to your office to see how deep it was. That's where using fluorescein to detect if we have a full penetration of the cornea or the conjunctiva is useful. This is called Seidel sign. There are a positive Seidel sign and a negative Seidel sign. Negative being there is not a full penetration of the cornea. We can see a negative Seidel sign on the left. In that case, we have a normal fluorescein pattern across that whole retina. We see no change in that fluorescein pattern across that eye. Now, in reality, you'd see a little defect wherever that, that scar is at, or that damaged area, or that puncture is at, but it, it wouldn't appear to change. It would always be brightly fluoresced. Conversely, though, if we have a positive cell that Seidel sign, we start to see aqueous humor start to penetrate or push its way out of the anterior chamber. This solution is no, doesn't have fluorescein in it, so in this case, it appears dark or black in, in a blue light. And that's what we see on the right of a positive Seidel sign, is we now see aqueous humor oozing through this wound, telling us there's been a full penetration into the anterior chamber of the eye. Again, this is, part, uh, is completely due to the interocular pressure causing aqueous humor to push it to leave the exit wound and this fluid does not have fluorescein in it, so it appears to be black under cobalt blue light. On the right, we can see two versions of that. One's a corneal Seidel sign on the bottom, and that's a conjunctival Seidel sign, positive Seidel sign on the top. Ultimately though, these are examples of negative staining because we see it black and it, it shows, illustrates the actual staining itself. Oftentimes to actually perform this though, we can't just install a general fluorescein Across the whole eye, we usually need to really paint that fluorescein on using a fluorescein strip. And that's what they've done in that upper image there, is they've really taken a fluorescein strip and put a ton of fluorescein in that one specific area to see what happens with that fluorescein as it drips out. Thank you. The end.